Hello and welcome to an India Today special broadcast on day 43 of the Russia-Ukraine conflict. I'm Gaurav Savant. This special broadcast comes to you from Ukraine's capital, Kiev, where the entire focus right now is on West pressure on Russia. Is the United States and are the United States and other countries mounting enough pressure to deter Russian President Vladimir Putin from carrying out this offensive against Ukraine and part two of this offensive that's aimed at the Donbass region. Over the course of the bulletin, we will talk about this in greater detail. But for now, West has not only imposed sanctions on Russia as a country, but also on individuals, including the two daughters of the Russian president, Vladimir Putin, Maria and Katrina. Sanctions have been imposed on them. Sanctions have also been imposed on Russia's foreign minister, Sergei Lavrov's wife and several other top leaders and their families in an attempt to deter Russia from pursuing its military offensive in Ukraine. The US is now hitting Putin where it hurts most. An economic squeeze on his family through sanctions on his daughters, Maria and Katrina, is the latest American move to punish the Russian president. Putin's family lives far away from the limelight, maintaining a very low, almost secretive lifestyle. The US believes that a lot of Putin's wealth is hidden among his family members and oligarch friends. Putin's daughters have been kept out of public view. But here's what's known about them. Maria Putina and Katrina Tekanova are in their mid-30s. Both are Putin's daughters from his first wife, Lyudmila Shrebneva. Maria is the Russian president's older daughter. She is the co-owner of Nomenko, a company involved in Russia's largest private investment healthcare project and is reported to be a specialist in rare diseases in children. She married a Dutch businessman, but it is unknown if they are still together. Putin's second daughter Katrina was once an acrobatic dancer and competed in rock and roll acrobatic dance contests for years. In 2020, she was appointed to run an artificial intelligence institute at Moscow State University. She currently heads the Inopractica Development Initiative funded by oligarchs who are part of Putin's inner circle. The new set of sanctions by the US also target the wife and daughter of Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov. US sanctions Russia again. Ban on new investment in Russia. Sanctions on banks. Sanctions on critical major state-owned enterprises. Sanctions on Russian government officials and family members. Not only the US, UK has announced further sanctions against eight oligarchs and the Russian banks in which their money is stashed. What's very clear is that the call for sanctions are getting personally close to Putin. Bureau Report, India Today. So there is a systematic Western economic offensive against Russia in an attempt to deter President Putin from carrying out the military offensive. And this Western offensive, so you also have uh, Spain, for example, that seized yachts of Russian oligarchs at the request of the US uh, government. Also sanctions in the United Kingdom and several other parts of Europe. But is this working? The Russian president and his team, they may be down, but they're clearly not out because the offensive in the east and the south continues. The Russian president continues to bash on regardless, especially in Mariupol. In the Donbass region, you have Russian missiles that have been targeting several areas. The Russians have also targeted Ukraine from sea. The Black Sea fleet of Russia has been, targeted, has been targeting Kherson and several other pockets. So the offensive now, Kyiv is silent, Kyiv is quiet, but there is an offensive towards the south and the east. It's likely to intensify in the days ahead with the government in Ukraine asking its civilians to evacuate Kharkiv, Mariupol, Kherson and some other pockets in this region as quickly as possible. It's been a week for Vladimir Putin, labelled a war criminal by the United States, 
called a terrorist madman by the country he has invaded, saddled with history's most crippling sanctions against Russia, and bogged down in a war that has no visible exit route. Cloistered in the Kremlin and his home near Moscow, Vladimir Putin, however, is showing no signs of losing steam. His missiles and bombs are still crashing into Ukrainian neighborhoods. And despite losing as many as six senior generals in this ongoing war, Putin doesn't appear to be militarily or even politically fatigued. For now, Ukraine in a very precarious situation. Uh, the, the, the unpredictability of what's going to happen next is, uh, uh, is, is uh, palpable when it comes to uh, conversations we have on either side. But the Russian side, very clear that there can be no need to expansion into Ukraine. His ruthless persona continues to radiate out from Moscow, signaling a typically grim determination to reach his stated objectives. As Russia's longest serving leader after Joseph Stalin, world leaders wonder if Vladimir Putin has finally landed himself and his country on the path of economic, political and military doom. We understand that Putin has crossed the last red line. He is now compared to uh, Hitler of 21st century. For a superpower leader who has stayed in power for nearly a quarter century and managed to establish Russia as a true world power, has Putin's famed psychological ruthlessness been derailed by a war where there doesn't appear to be a dignified exit? Or is the world about to witness Vladimir Putin's famous will to overwhelm, digesting the losses, casting aside the sanctions and showing a terrifying appetite for damage to his military and reputation. Is Putin about to signal to the world that he will finish what he started? Is he signaling in fact that the West has betrayed those they made promises to? A month is up in an invasion that Putin had smirked and indicated would be over in the blink of an eye. What Putin does next means everything, not just for Ukraine, but for the most intriguing Russian leader of our time. With Geeta Mohan in Moscow, you report India Today. So, Russian President Vladimir Putin continues to bash on regardless and perhaps a lot of this has to do with his childhood, his training and his activities in the KGB. So he is this black belt judo expert. He was in Russia's counterintelligence. In fact, in the Soviet Union, he was with the KGB. Post-Soviet era, uh, he joined and headed the FSB, the counterintelligence. He speaks uh, German very well. He speaks English very well. In counterintelligence, he was tracking the Western countries and their operatives in the Soviet bloc or the erstwhile Soviet bloc very closely. But what was his background like? What explains the Russian president's relentless assault on pockets of Ukraine that he says should be a part of of Russia. Ukraine should be in Russian influence and not a part of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization countries. Our next report tells us more. Putin has been called by many names and now Moscow's undisputed leader has the world's attention. Some even have taken interest in Putin's childhood to understand his present actions. While his past will not justify his present, it's worth having a look into and understanding who Putin really is. Born in 1952 in Leningrad, which is now called St. Petersburg, his childhood was rife with hardship. His city then was under a long Nazi siege during World War II that killed most of the population. The siege has been termed genocide and is described as the world's most destructive siege of a city. His father had taken part in World War II and was wounded badly. Putin's mother, on the other hand, did odd jobs and had almost died of starvation during the Nazi siege of Leningrad. Putin's family had a room in a rundown apartment shared with two other families. So there was always scarcity of hot water, food and little or no heat in their room. While his parents worked, he would be left with another family or on his own. 
he was left to look out for himself even when he was bullied in the neighborhood so his childhood saw food insecurity bullying shelter issue war time and even parental trauma but he luckily found mentors learned judo and got a law degree and that would lead up to his first job in the russian government when he joined soviet union's main security agency kgb before entering the kremlin Experts say that Putin's childhood dictated his personality. Moreover, he was culturally and psychologically married to the idea of Soviet Union, which stopped existing. One US secretary once said that when she met Putin, she found him to be unemotional and cold. And if you look back at figures like Nazi Germany's Adolf Hitler and Soviet Union's Joseph Stalin, they all had childhood trauma that is often linked back to their actions by historians. Now, let me draw your focus to his announcement that he made before invading Ukraine. Let's have a look at these two words, denazify and demilitarize, because these two words have been used by him to somewhat explain to the world why he is invading Ukraine. And now link that to his childhood trauma of living under military hell, bullying and war trauma. In his mind, he is the victim here and he is defending himself as he is threatened by Ukraine. 43 days, remember, and the war refusing to end. And this time, of course, while millions have left, the ones still in Ukraine are facing Russian hostilities. Now, Russia has been on a relentless bombing spree, intensifying, escalating attacks in the country's southern and eastern areas. Luhansk governor has now warned that Russia is building up troops for an offensive in the coming three to four days. He's also claiming, take a look now as we look at these three images, that while forces continue to attack the city of Popasana with rocket launchers and aircraft, due to which evacuation of civilians has hindered, on Wednesday, Ukraine warned the residents of eastern Ukraine to evacuate Kharkiv, Lugansk and also Donetsk immediately or risk death. Meanwhile, several other regions in Ukraine are still reeling under attacks by the Russian troops. For example, in the suburbs of the Severodonetsk, residential buildings have faced attacks. Explosions caught on camera. Chernihiv completely in ruins now. Shelled buildings, charred vehicles, uprooted trees painting a devastating picture for the world to see. Meanwhile, Russia has been further isolated globally over the massacre of Bucha. Just to give you a background, on Thursday, UNGA will be holding a vote in the evening to expel Russia from the Human Rights Council. Just days after, Ukrainian President Zelensky spoke at the Security Council demanding Russia's expulsion. But Russia calls these killings at Bucha to be orchestrated and staged by Ukraine to derail the peace talks. So the de-escalation, the de-escalation by Russia is in the central and western parts of Ukraine as it appears, but it is instead being matched with corresponding escalation in the southern and eastern parts of the country. Attacks are being mounted from land, but also from the Black Sea. And it is being called phase two of the military operations. What does that mean? Russia has intensified its attacks, taking out the deadliest weapons from its arsenal. And could this actually be a signal? that the escalation will only be intensifying in the next few days. Caliber cruise missiles lift off from a small Russian Navy ship in the Black Sea, aimed at seven different targets in southern Ukraine. A Russian Su-35 air superiority fighter taking off and conducting a strike mission on an undisclosed target inside Ukraine. A Russian anti-air system launching and hitting what is claimed to be a Ukrainian Baryaktar drone, an unmanned system that has been giving hell to Russian vehicles in the weeks gone by. And these latest images of Russian Onyx supersonic cruise missile being launched at Ukrainian targets in the eastern part of the country. The de-escalation by Russia in the central and western parts of Ukraine are being matched with corresponding escalation in the southern and eastern parts of the country, borne out by an unending stream of footage of the targeted attack. The domination of eastern Ukraine will require sustained escalation in this part of the country. And that's what we are witnessing as we travel through the Donbass region. 
The Russian forces are regrouping with attacks from land and from sea. The southern part has become the prime target in the second phase of war. In the airspace above Ukraine, Russia continues to be challenged formidably by Ukraine's weapons. This is a Russian Su-35 air superiority fighter that was shot down using NATO weaponry earlier this week. The pilot now in Ukrainian captivity. But could Russia be planning to deploy its stealth fighter, the Su-57, to conduct strike missions in Ukraine? The Su-57 is a fifth-generation fighter built to remain barely visible to radar and other sensors and could trump Ukraine's air defences or at least make life more difficult for them. A citizen's video in the early days of the war was believed to be Su-57 on a test bombing mission over the city of Zytomyr, west of Kyiv, though this advanced aircraft type definitely hasn't been deployed in any real numbers. With Putin narrowing his attacks to the southern and eastern parts of Ukraine, the strength of Russia's military could become more concentrated. With thousands of square kilometers of Ukraine already laid to waste, could what come next be Putin's most decisive escalation? With Mosami Singh in southern Ukraine and Gita Mohan in eastern Ukraine, Bureau Report, India Today. Now, remember, there is also a human cost of such wars. While parents, who are clearly adults, are fighting for their motherland at the war front, some teenagers, children, are also now standing by them in an attempt to help the army. Now, the Odessa area, where some teenagers have created a check post, they are guarding it, even if with their toy guns. These teenagers say they are trying and want to help the Ukrainian army. My colleague, Mosami Singh, brings you this report from Odessa. Take a look. <laughs> on our way on the outskirts of Odessa, we hit this uh, barricade and which was manned by these two youngsters, Ivan and Maxim. You can see both of them holding their toy guns. Yes, those are toy guns, but they have prepared this uh, check post by themselves. In fact, they wanted to do it and in participation with the civil defense uh, here, they have prepared this entire check post. So you see, uh, they they uh, they are wearing a uniform, synchronized with their jackets and sweatshirts. And here they have uh, built uh, tires, put tires on the road. Here there is a, a manual checking that's happening in this on this entire site. Barricades, anyone? Um, the, all this done by you all. Это была моя идея построить этот блокпост. Мы гуляли с моими друзьями. Нам стало скучно. Мы увидели в интернете, что ну. Иван is talking about uh, the the way he created this entire thing. What did he say, Olga? <laughs> Ivan has told that it was his own idea. Uh, when war started, they saw that they saw our army, they saw everything in the network, and uh, they have decided that they need to help our army uh, as they can. The children, they made it themselves. They asked, of course, uh, adults help them uh, with the everything to construct this but the idea was uh, child's the idea and you know and also uh, they want to do something to help our army so yeah we have a uh, sir from the civil defense can we have a word with him yes, 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 children. children sir are very active and energetic оружие да они с утра идут в школу учатся потom приходят сюда Importantly, your big message. Olga, what did Sir say? Uh, he said that uh, people in Ukraine before this war, there were a lot of nationalities who lived in Ukraine in peace. But when war starts, all these people of different nationalities, uh, in Odessa region there are more than 200 nationalities, different nationalities, and they became nation, one nation, yes. People like gave, gave together, they are ready to help each other, they are ready to protect our earth, because uh, uh, 
People want to be independent. Ukraine wants to be an independent country. It, it is. It was before Russian aggression. And uh, uh, even these children, they understand that this is important. It's like a game for them. Yes, it's like a game, but they love, they, they love their homeland. Truly, this is a, a undying spirit of Ukraine, relentless. And, you know, even as we talk, these are cold winds, you know, cold winds are blowing. Uh, come on, Ivan, show us your bunker. So we'll take a look at Ivan's bunker created by children at this children's check post. This. We are in this bunker that has been created by Ivan and Maxim and this is no child's play because these children are a part of the civil defense team and that's why you can see that uh, bunkers like these are a common scene in uh, the suburbs and outskirts of the city. These bunkers have been prepared by Ivan, Maxim and his family members. You can see tires here, uh, sacks here in this medicine kit has been kept with all the necessary medicines here for a long haul you can see bread uh, toast biscuits water and all preparations made here you have a blanket uh, minimum means of survival but this is a matter of uh, a fight for existence and that's one reason that why the Russian army is facing such a stiff challenge because the Ukrainians refuse to bow down, re refuse to uh, kneel down in front of the Russian aggression and in fact it is the strong spirit that prevails in the entire stretch with the army. With the journalist Parminder Sharma, this is Mosmi Singh in Odessa for India Today.